Hey guys and welcome back to another YouTube video. In this video I'll be going through the trade targets for AFL Fantasy Round 3. I'm just setting it up quickly here and going through who I really like, who I think is um, one that you should really be targeting. I'm in the top 4, 5, 6, 6 sort of speak for themselves I guess. Um, and yeah, so that's why uh, a lot of North players and um, also uh, a lot of, I think, St Kilda players getting a lot of love as well, which is a good thing in itself. And hopefully we get some debuants because there was one guy in the VFL, not to name names, we'll get down to him later, who absolutely tore the place up um, off the halfback flank. But before we get into this video, remember to like and subscribe, turn the notification bell on so you know when I upload and let's get into this video. So, first off, um, D'Ambrosio's top at 11k trading, and there's no, um, there's an obvious reason why. <laughs> it's his 19 break even 51. He scored at an average of 95 across the first two games, and it's a consistent 94, 96. So that's why he's um, there, and he's in my top two um, trading targets alongside most of everyone else in the league, as you can see with Tom Powell. And this really just depends, and I've said this advice the whole week, I'm probably leaning more towards Powell because if we get a rookie defender. If we get a rookie defender that isn't a pink, well, we have pink, but isn't a key, then I will go, um, then I will go Tom Powell because in my genuine belief is that Tom Powell is going to be a top six or top eight forward, whereas Massimo D'Ambrosio probably isn't going to be. And so, um, even though the buyers probably link up better for D'Ambrosio, and that's thinking, I think, way too far ahead, I reckon Tom Powell is going to be a better use. Um, yes, he does have the round 12, but I think he is going to be uh, more of use in the long run because you're going to be saving, I think, a trade in going to him. And um, in the end, in the buys, you can go to other players, etc. But um, that's not really going to have much of an impact. But I just think Tom Powell's more, his game is more um, suited to a potential um, sort of consistent 95. Whereas I don't know if D'Ambrosio is going to consistently get 95, 96, considering if we just look quickly at the game here. And I'm just going to bring it up on my um, phone to show... Um, to sort of read off the stats here, just trying to find the uh, the Hawthorne game. Uh, you'll find in the Hawthorne game in the first quarter, D'Ambrosio ended up with 32 in that kick around uh, where he ended up with five marks. And then in the second quarter as well, he had, um, he was down, where is he down at? Just trying to find him. He was down at 21 in the second. And then in the third again, he went again and scored 32 on a more consistent basis um, of scoring inputs of tackles and marks alongside actual um, disposals. And then in the last, he had an 11. So there's a lot more volatile, I think, scoring. And then when you look at the likes of the North Melbourne game with Tom Powell, you'll see that in quarter one, he had a uh, um, 22, quarter two, he had a 41, quarter three, he had a, uh, um, where is he now? In quarter three, where is he? I probably he had a thirteen, and then in quarter four he had uh, thirty-seven. So probably that probably doesn't actually help my cause in showing that. But I think that his uh, role will generally have a more um, consistent scoring, and I just wonder if Massimo D'Ambrosio's score, as you can see here, eight marks, um, is going to be highly dependent on marks, whereas Tom Powell's you'll see here. Um, a more decent spread of four and five. I think that's more replicable. And the two the two goals as well doesn't really help the cause that he's going to um, score consistently because he's not going to kick two goals a game. But I reckon he can average 95 more often than the likes of D'Ambrosio, who's going to rely heavily on... Um, who's going to uh, rely heavily on the heavy marks that he's going to have and non-disposal points, whereas I don't think the likes of a, um, a Tom Powell in the position, more of a midfield, is going to have that same struggle. So that's why I'd probably have Tom Powell as number one, especially if you can get another like Ari Schoenmaker or something like that if we get him to debut. Uh, Matt Crouch, 
He's been really good, but I question what's going to happen with that midfield mix as there's been heavy, heavy talk about it. Something's got to change. They're not going to get finals with that midfield mix. It says um, there's a lot saying that um, the likes of a Laird will permanently move out, but it's got to be some. I think it's got to be a combination of Crouch and Laird, to be honest with you, 50 50 each of them. Um, and you will get, uh, I think, Crouch will still score well, but I think it will be sort of a 90 scorer and not this sort of um, 110s that he's been going at. So I reckon that's why um, you will see uh, Matt Crouch dip a little bit, and that's why I'm probably not as certain on him, even though he's ranked 12th for the season. And I wouldn't be surprised if I end up having to trade him in <laughs> in the end because my um, me saying no to him early on is probably going to show that um, he's going to be one that averages like 105 across. <laughs> he, I wouldn't be surprised if he ends up averaging 100 for the whole year. But I'm just doubtful that his role necessarily holds, especially if Adelaide want to push on because their midfield mix is stuffed and um, they need some run and gun in there. And Crouch and Laird just cannot be in the same midfield, to be honest with you. And I really don't see Laird just going um, completely out of the midfield mix and that doesn't open up enough time. If you're only dropping 40% uh, from Laird in itself, then that doesn't open enough time for the midfielders of the the sort of Soligo, Rankin, Richelli, um, McHenry to come through and really impact that uh, midfield and provide some run and gun. Sarong, he's been going crazy, 143 average across the first two games. Um, season one rank, obviously, and um, I think he will have a dud game here and there, and I reckon that he will slowly come down in price. I really wish I'd picked him up at the start, as he was one that was in my preseason plans like the whole time. So yeah, we really wish I had started with him. He has the nice buy as well, so um, one that I'll definitely have come season end because he's just racking up the disposals at the moment. He's got um, what's that? Something like forty disposals a game or something. So obviously had had the uh, North Melbourne matchup, which was an easy matchup, but did uh, extremely well in the Brisbane matchup. I wouldn't be surprised if he copped some attention in the next couple of weeks. But yeah, definitely one to just monitor and, and grab if you um, if you can at the moment. Um, Isaac Keeney, Taylor Adams is now a test, so that could impact his role, but Isaac's probably almost leading the Brownlow at this point. So um, they probably got to keep him in the midfield. So that's why I would, um, I probably wouldn't be trading into him now, given that's only two games that he's got um, before the buy. But it is two fruitful games where he could go 130 in both of them. So there, there is that thought there, and that he would, with a 60 covering score, still average effectively um, 110 for you, which for the price tag of that, uh, 110 for three games, and you'd be getting some um, price rises out of it. He'd probably go up, I don't know, 80, 90k in that time. And you'd be getting him and he's priced at roughly about 94, 95 at this point. Um, you'd be getting him roughly 20 points under, 10 point, 10, 15, 10, 20 points under. So you'd still be getting a lot of value. Wayne Malira, I think he's one that could take it up to the next level. 122, struggled in the first game against Geelong with only 84 on five marks. No tackles so far this year for him. Um, but yeah, so he really stepped it up against Collingwood with one two two, and now comes up against Essendon, Richmond, G, uh, GWS, Western Bulldogs, and Port. I reckon there is some value there in Wangadi Malira. Toby Pink, I understand this. If you're going to do the Tom Powell trade, a lot of us have um, Caulfield or something like that, and you got to get off Caulfield. So Toby Pink is the only defender currently that is really worthwhile that has an um, debut. Sorry, that has debuted because you got like Yuland on the bye, you got other sort of rookie defenders, and you'll see here Irish Showmaker, the probably prime rookie defender that hasn't debuted. So, yeah, I don't mind the Toby Pink if you're going to do like a Powell and just have a Toby Pink there for the next couple, um, couple games when you have um, no DPPs and you've got some bye guys out with like me with Whitfield and stuff like that. And when Howes goes, I'm going to need to probably field Pink. But yeah, that's um, that sort of, I don't mind that trade. Sherry, I understand it. I probably would be almost just holding um, Grundy at this point. Sherry's got a 32, Grundy's got an 81, so it's not, it's a 49 gap. And Sherry went 104 against Jackson. He's got, um, he's got what, um, Tom DeConing and Pitnet maybe, is it? Or Tom DeConing and also, um, and also the likes of a, uh, 
Ben Mc- uh, no Harry Mackay in the ruck for uh, Carlton. Let's just look at their lineup quickly. They had um, Mackay, De Koning, and then they also had Pitnet as an emergency. I wouldn't be surprised if they go double ruck given. Uh, but then again, Tom De Koning did really well against Nank Curvis, and Nank went one o three. So, I mean, he did his, um, he held Nank to what he usually averages. And then in, in Brisbane, um, McInerney only went 82, and that's sort of around where McInerney averages. So, I, I, I do think Tristan Jerry probably goes in 90 um, this week. I don't think he averages like 112. I don't think he goes 112. What he's averaging, I think he goes a little bit below that. Um, so we'll wait and see on that one. But um, yeah, I I do think that um, Brody Grundy will probably have a really good day in um, in his matchup. I mean, you're looking at um, Richmond when they played um, the Gold Coast. You saw that uh, Wits only went 77. That was against Naismith, so slightly different. Ruckman um, in round one against um, against Carlton, we saw that um, Tom De Koning went 107, which is a similar ruck um, to the likes of a Brody Grundy. So that is a good matchup, I think, for Brody. And then round two, we saw Port Adelaide um, ruck go, um, Soldo go a 59 against Nank, and I don't think Soldo will have much of an impact. Um, I think he's going to be like a, he would be like a 70 anyway, so I don't think there's too much to worry about there for um, Brody Grundy. So I don't think that, based on that, that Sherry is necessarily a must-have trade-in this week. I think they're going to potentially even... I think potentially even Grundy um, outscores Sherry. And then Grundy has the West Coast matchup next week anyway, where he'll have a much, much better break-even, I would expect, um, in comparison to his one as that 53 starts to filter down the ways and its weighting becomes less and less and you replace it with 90s. Um, So I reckon that will mean that his break-even starts to will go to like a 75 the next week. And then um, on his buy, he'll be probably 760, 770K, which could be around the same price as Jerry, but um, I'm not too, too worried about them at the moment. Zane Dersma, um, I understand why this is a potential trade-in, but I just think that Chris Burgess is probably the better one to trade in at this point with just a better um, break even, I believe, and also like 100K cheaper. And you just look at the projections like we did with Cash Cows uh, yesterday. Jeremy Sharp, um, I understand this trade-in as well as I think he can be a 75-80 guy and be a constant guy. With his job security, it's there. It's safe. He's going to be a 75 guy. And 75 guys rise to like 550, 600 at least. So you're still going to get a lot of cash gen out of him. I'm just one that um, at like 370k or whatever Jeremy Sharp's at now. I won that I would already have been jumped on. That's why, um, similar to Zane Dersma, he's probably going to go up in price, but not as much as Jim Sharp. Um, but I'm more conscious about um, Zane Dersma probably has better alternatives than the likes of a Jeremy Sharp. Just given the role and stuff like that, Jeremy Sharp should be scoring more. Harry Sheasel, understand this as well. He's been going nuts. And so, yeah, understand trading him in, especially I'm guessing given that it's a defender, it's probably going to be Hayden Young that's being traded out. Show and Maker, understand that as well after 43 touches and like 13 marks or whatever in the VFL. They should be giving him a game, but whether they do is another thing. Um, Steele's been rocking in the midfield, so this is probably Newcomb. Um, trading out of Newcomb to Steele, understand that. Uh, Luke Jackson, I probably wouldn't be trading him in given that Sean um, Darcy is about two weeks away, I believe. Two, three weeks away. And it looks like um, Luke Jackson will probably get... Uh, let's just look at the fixtures here. Um, Sean Darcy is probably going to... I would suspect Sean Darcy comes back round six against Eagles. And honestly, you could probably just hold Luke Jackson, honestly, as a ruck option. and Because he probably will still have 50-50 rucking. They probably will only play Sean Darcy for three quarters, two quarters, something like that, and then sub him out. And then have a, another big up there as well to just ruck as well. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if that happens against the Eagles. And so I'm still going to be probably holding Jackson through um, that. And then once they say, oh, yeah, Sean Darcy's gotten through that. And then against um, the Western Bulldogs, you're probably looking at trading Luke Jackson then to hopefully um, another premium and then also getting some cash as well to get... um, 
to also get uh, your way up to another uh, premium, I guess. Maybe you hold Jackson, I don't know exactly, but yeah, that would be sort of my thought alongside is that you're just trying to gain money out of it um, a little bit. Um, then we go Richmond, uh, then you got Sydney, yeah, so that's sort of what I'm looking at there. Cows understand as well, but we'll talk about that in the rookie, um, in the cash cows, I guess, segment. Harvey Gallagher, we talked about that. Oli Dempsey, we talked about that. Zach Butters understand this as well. He's been going crazy, but they were two easier matchups. So I sort of see him regressing a little bit towards that 108 range when he gets the tougher matchups. Josh Draper, he's a key defender. I wouldn't be uh, getting him in, especially um, we don't. I don't know exactly what's happening with Frio's injury list. I haven't checked it, but um, there could be guys coming back. There could be different roles. Like maybe you put more accountability on Luke Ryan and then you'd get in a smaller defender. Um, Williams, I understand this, but I don't think he will make too, too much of a difference. Um, has a 34 break even as well. So it's not like it's game breaking of like a zero where he could really gain 60 or 70 K. Um, but yeah, hopefully he puts up an 80 or 90 this week and we can see him rise in price. Um, Harvey Thomas, no, thank you. He is on the buy. So you can just pick him up next week. Chris Burgess, I reckon will keep on rising, especially if we get no rookies in the back line and people think, do I want Pink or do I want Burgess? They're probably going to choose Burgess, um, given Fremantle's. And we talked about this in the uh, Cash Cow segment, but I reckon that he is probably going to be more chosen if we don't get a show maker. So that would be that. And then Mana, I can understand as well, but their teams don't get named till like Saturday or whatever. So you can't really go with Mana, and you're probably going to get safety that Mana's got another week of price rises before he really gets away from you in a couple weeks' time if he goes 60 60. And then you get to Elliot Yo and stuff like that, where um, they're really low number in trade ins. Then we go to the trade outs quickly Sexton, Caulfield, Newcomb, Hayden Young, Whit and Hayden Young, top four. Understand all of them. Lockie Whitfield, don't really understand this too, too much. He's going to, in my eyes, be a top six defender or a top eight defender, so you can just hold him. Tom Green, um, he's like third in the comp or whatever for points, so second in season rank, so I wouldn't be trading him out. Sam Flanders, wouldn't be trading him out. This is a lot of people that are buy flipping, and this is exactly how the likes of us who have been copying it start to tr um, catch up because these guys are just going to be buy flipping and they're not really gaining too much value in my opinion out of doing this um, especially because you're foregoing you're getting maybe 40 points but you're losing out on potentially some cash cows for um, the season and that's how you sort of lose um, you maybe lose 200k or whatever out of cash cows um, or that 200k can be realized a little bit earlier and that's that uh, 40 points that you gained in one round can be made up 10 points per round in four in four rounds. And if you do that with two players or whatnot, two or three players, then that starts to mount. And that's probably 40 points now in the short term for like 100 points that us that are getting cash cows will gain in the long term. And I'd rather 100 points over 40 points. So it's a 60 point game for those who are going for cash cows in my opinion. But anyway, that is the video there. And I'll see you on Thursday for my... Um, was it predictions as well as the team reveals. So I'll see you guys in that video. Bye guys.